Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Gordon College. My name is Judd Carlberg, and I have the privilege of serving as president here at Gordon. I know we have a number of off-campus guests with us tonight, and we want to give them a special welcome. And I'm glad to see that many students have joined us. Uh, tonight is formatted as a debate, a discussion between two men who you'll meet in a moment who disagree fundamentally on the issues. And that's part of what it means to be in a college with intellectual debate, because it's a learning experience for us, no matter what position you hold. And so I want to welcome you here tonight, and I hope that over the next hour, an hour and a half, you'll uh, stretch your minds and you will be educated about a very important issue that impacts every single person in this room. We're going to be uh, moderated tonight by uh, Ryan Goff, who is the Jerusalem Athens Program Coordinator. And uh, Ryan is going to introduce our guest speakers, our debaters, and then he's also going to outline for you the format that we'll use in the debate. So let's welcome Ryan and our guests to the platform. Thank you, President Carlberg. As he said, my name is Ryan Groff. I work with the Jerusalem and Athens Forum here at Gordon, and it's my honor, honor to be moderating this evening's debate. Tonight's event is part of Gordon's annual Faith Seeking Understanding lecture series. The title, Faith Seeking Understanding, is most clearly associated with the medieval theologian Anselm of Canterbury. It was chosen for it suggests our view here at Gordon that our faith should not be a matter of self-satisfied piety and isolation from the life of culture and intellect. Rather, we should be engaged in the great issues and ideas and debates of our day. Our topic this evening, theodicy, God, and suffering, will certainly be no exception. Before introducing our format and debaters, a brief word of thanks is in order to Mr. Dale and Sarah Ann Fowler. Their generosity helps the college flourish in so many ways, and we can thank them particularly for supporting this evening's debate. Please join me in expressing our appreciation to them. The format this evening is structured, but with some flexibility. It will consist of the five elements noted during, the, during your arrival. Opening statements, rebuttals, follow-up statements, a 20-minute question and answer time, and a three-minute closing statements. During the Q&A, I will read questions posed by you, the audience, which you may write on the note cards provided. They will then be collected about 40 minutes into the debate. If you're doing the math, that's around the rebuttals just after. And if you're now thinking, I should have picked up a note card, just raise your hand. Our ushers would be happy to bring you one. Without further ado, an introduction to our debaters this evening. Dinesh D'Souza is the president of the King's College, New York City, and is a former White House domestic policy analyst. A graduate of Dartmouth College, he is the author of numerous New York Times best-selling books and is a frequent guest commentator on CNN, Fox News, and has also appeared on Comedy Central's Colbert Report. Investors Business Daily calls him one of the top young public policy makers the country. The New York Times Magazine named him one of America's most influential conservative thinkers. A policy analyst in the Reagan White House, D'Souza also served as John M. Olin Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and the Robert and Karen Rishwain Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Please join me in welcoming Dinesh D'Souza. Bart Ehrman is James A. Gray Distinguished Professor of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. A graduate of Wheaton College, Illinois, Ehrman received his Master of Divinity and PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary. Since then, he has published extensively in the fields of New Testament and early Christianity, having written and edited numerous books, 
including multiple New York Times bestsellers, scholarly articles, and book reviews. Among his fields of scholarly expertise are the historical Jesus, the early Christian Apocrypha, the Apostolic Fathers, and the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. Like Dinesh, he has also been a guest on the Colbert Report. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including the 2009 J.W. Pope Spirit of Inquiry Teaching Award, the 1993 UNC Undergraduate Student Teaching Award, the 1994 Philip and Ruth Hedelman Prize for Artistic and Scholarly Achievement, and finally, the Bowman and Gordon Gray Award for Excellence in Teaching. Again, please join me in welcoming Bart Ehrman. Having agreed to introduce tonight's topic, Bart Ehrman will begin. Bart. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Uh, how many of you would consider yourselves to be committed Christians? Okay. How many of you are pretty sure you're going to disagree with everything I say? <laughs> Good. Just three of you. Very good. How many of you are being honest? <laughs> it's a pleasure being with you. I, uh, I started out my study of the New Testament and theology and my uh, understanding of the world as a very committed Christian. When I was uh, in high school, I had a born-again experience, and after high school, went to the Moody Bible Institute, where I studied for three years to receive a diploma in Bible and theology. After Moody, I went to Wheaton College, uh, which uh, you students, I'm sure, all know. Uh, and uh, after Wheaton, I went to the Princeton Theological Seminary, where I did a Master's of Divinity degree, being trained for ministry. Uh, after my Master's of Divinity degree, I was the pastor of the Princeton Baptist Church uh, for a time. Uh, my point in mentioning this is that I want it to be clear that I started out as a firm believer, uh, a uh, solid evangelical Christian, and stood in the evangelical tradition for uh, a number of years. My views changed over the years to what you will be hearing uh, this evening, and I want to give you some uh, sense for why they changed by uh, explaining what happened to me uh, and what happened to my thinking over a period of time. When I was doing my PhD at Princeton Theological Seminary, I was also teaching at Rutgers University, uh, teaching undergraduates, and one semester I was uh, asked to teach a class called The Problem of Suffering in the Biblical Traditions. This was a course that was designed to deal with what the Bible has to say about why there is suffering. The technical term for that kind of discourse about suffering is called theodicy. The, it's called theodicy, uh, the, the, it comes from two Greek words, uh, which mean God's justness. How can God be righteous, or how can God be just, given the state of affairs in this world? Given the misery and the suffering around the world, how, how is it all fair if a God is in control? If God is all-powerful, if God is all-loving, why is there suffering? This was in the 1980s, and uh, frankly, at the time, I had trouble convincing my students at Rutgers that there was a problem of suffering. <laughs> they were, uh, tended to be middle-class students who uh, uh, were uh, doing very well, thank you very much, and didn't realize, uh, many of them, just how enormous the problem of suffering could be. This happened to be during one of the major Ethiopian famines, and so one of the things that I did was to bring in newspaper clippings and pictures from the newspaper of, of a woman who was uh, starving to death with a child at her breast who couldn't get any milk who was also starving to death and pointing this to my students and saying, this is a problem. How does one explain this if there is a God in charge of this world? Well, the class was not so much about the philosophical problems of suffering as about what the Bible has to say about it. And studying the Bible, what it has to say about it, my students and I came away with uh, two major points that are quite interesting and relevant for tonight's debate. The first point is the Bible has a lot of things to say about suffering, but many of the things that different authors say about suffering in the Bible are, are at odds with one another. Uh, for example, in the Old Testament, 
the prophets, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, page after page of the prophets, proclaim that the reason God's people are suffering is because God is punishing them for their sins. They've done things wrong, and that's why God has brought so much misery upon them. Famine, drought, epidemics, military disaster. God is doing this to His people in order to get them to return to Him. The book of Job disagrees with that point of view. According to the book of Job, people who do what God wants are the ones sometimes who suffer. It is the innocent who suffer. Whereas the prophets said, if you would return to God, and uh, th that the suffering then would be, uh, would be alleviated, Job indicates the people who turn to God, in fact, are the ones who experience the most misery. It is the innocent, not the guilty, who suffer, and God allows it even though he could stop it. The book of Daniel and the book of Revelation in the New Testament also disagree with the prophets. Daniel and Revelation indicate that it's not God who causes the problem of suffering, it's the forces of evil who cause suffering. And it's not against people who are guilty, as in the prophets, it's against people who are innocent. The book of Proverbs disagrees with all of the ones I've mentioned so far. In the book of Proverbs, it's neither God nor the forces of evil that are causing suffering. The universe, according to Proverbs, is set up in such a way that the righteous are rewarded and the sinners suffer. If you are righteous, according to Proverbs, you won't suffer. If you are sinful, you will. But that contradicts what Job had to say, that the innocent suffer. And Job is contradicted by what the prophets have to say, that God punishes, punishes only the guilty, and those who turn to God are rewarded. The first point that comes out by a study of suffering in the Bible is that the different biblical authors disagree with one another. There are discrepancies. The other point that came out in this class that I taught, uh, that I realized I think maybe for the first time in a big way uh, while teaching this class, is that the Bible does not teach the point of view that many people hold today about why they're suffering. I, I would imagine that if we did a survey of all of you here tonight and asked you why is there suffering, one of the principal reasons virtually everybody would say is it's because of free will. At Rutgers, I started calling this the robot explanation. Uh, I called it the robot explanation because uh, that was the term everybody would use. It, it goes like this. If God had decided that we didn't have free will, we would all be programmed like robots. And we wouldn't be able to do anything we wanted to do. We would only do what we were programmed to do. But if we were programmed only to do good, of course, there'd be no suffering because we wouldn't hurt one another. The, the fact that we have free will shows that we are not robots and therefore uh, we can do evil to one another. We can hurt one another. We can oppress one another. We can kill one another. This is, uh, this, uh, is as, as I said, what I call the robot explanation, and uh, the Bible actually does not have the robot explanation in it, in part because there are no robots in the Bible, but in part because the Bible has other explanations for why they're suffering, the ones that I've just uh, given you a minute ago. There are, of course, hints in the Bible that people can do harm to other people. But as I studied the problem with this class at Rutgers, I came to realize that there are problems with this robot explanation. For one thing, it's an incomplete explanation that doesn't solve the problem of why they're suffering. You all will remember a tsunami that killed 300,000 people. Whose free will caused that? Or more recently, an earthquake in Haiti that killed 230,000 people. Whose free will caused that? The problem with the free will explanation is that it doesn't explain natural disasters. Moreover, I think the free will explanation is philosophically problematic for a reason that a lot of people haven't thought about. Most people I know who think that, uh, who have the explanation that it's all because of free will, uh, most people I know who advance that idea are themselves Christians. These are people who believe that when they die, they're going to go to heaven. They also believe that there will be no suffering in heaven. And so one might ask, will there be free will in heaven? If there's free will in heaven, but no suffering in heaven, 
That must mean that it is possible to have a world with free will but without suffering. So why don't we have a world with free will without suffering? Well, it obviously wasn't set up that way, but it means that the free will explanation doesn't really explain the problem. Moreover, I should say that the free will explanation doesn't resolve what I would call the theological problem of suffering. The theological problem of suffering is very simple. If God is all-powerful, he can do anything that he wants. If he's all-loving, he doesn't want people to suffer any more than you want people to suffer, and you're a, lo you're a loving person. God can do anything he wants. He doesn't want people to suffer, and yet people suffer. How does one explain that? Well, that's the problem of theodicy. Most Christians think that God intervenes in history intervenes in our lives in order to deal with suffering. God intervenes in our lives in order to deal with suffering so that when something goes wrong, we can pray about it and God will help resolve the problem. If that's the case, why doesn't God intervene more often? We all have experienced suffering in our lives, and we know of others who have. After I finished this teaching, this class at Rutgers, I experienced a lot of suffering myself, as did other people. Cancer, taking away loved ones in the prime of life, teenage suicide, birth defects, failed marriages, a friend who escaped the killing fields of Cambodia, homelessness, poverty, starvation. We all know people who have had these problems. I kept reading about issues pertaining to suffering. The Holocaust, six million Jews murdered in cold blood. Genocides in Cambodia, Bosnia, Rwanda, Darfur. A flu epidemic in 1918 that killed 30 million people worldwide. The flu, world poverty and starvation. I came to a point where none of the biblical answers or traditional answers were satisfying to me. Most of the Bible has one thing in common. It believes in a God who intervenes in our world. That is the basis for the uh, traditions in the Old Testament of God saving the children of Israel and making them his people. It's the basis for the belief in Jesus' cross and resurrection, that God intervened in our world for good. God's intervention is what's behind our idea that prayer works. But if God intervenes, why doesn't He? In our world, every five seconds, a child dies of starvation. Every five seconds. In our world, every minute, 25 people die from diseases from unclean water. Every hour, 300 people die of malaria. If God intervenes, why doesn't he intervene? The Holocaust, genocides, terrorist attacks, starvation, poverty, tsunamis, hurricanes, earthquakes. Eventually, the answers did not satisfy me, and I came to be unable to affirm the very basis of my Christian faith. I became an agnostic. I no longer believe in the God of the Bible. I do not believe in a good and all-powerful God who intervenes in this world. Let me stress that it's not my goal to make anyone else an agnostic, and it's not my goal to deconvert anyone from whatever their faith is. Uh, it's not my goal, it's not my desire uh, at all. It is my goal to get people to think, and to be more tolerant of people who think differently from them. Many of you who are Christian would agree with the statement that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. But does God love everyone and have a wonderful plan for their lives? Even for those who are starving to death, who are crushed with horrible diseases, who are crippled with pain, whose lives have been torn apart by the death of a loved one? Does God love the homeless, the hungry, the maimed, the murdered? Then why doesn't he do something about it? One viable response is to say that God wants us to do something about it. And I absolutely would agree with that, if I believed in God. 
that God wants us to do something about it. We should do something about suffering in our world. We should commit ourselves to doing something about our suffering in our world. We should work to alleviate the suffering in our world. Absolutely yes. But that doesn't answer the theological question. Why doesn't God intervene? I can't believe in a God who intervenes in the world to make it a better place. If you do believe in such a God, you need to figure out how to reconcile your faith with the facts of reality. How do you make sense of this world of pain, misery, and suffering without coming away with a simple answer? A basic answer, a simple answer, how do you have something that matches the complexity of the suffering? This is the biggest question you will ever face as a Christian and even as a human being. Why is there pain and misery and suffering in the world? It's a question that we should all acknowledge. And whether or not we find a satisfying answer, we should all realize that there is enormous suffering out there, and all of us, Christian and non-Christian alike, should do everything we can to relieve it and to help those in need. Thank you very much. Opening statement by Dinesh. Hello, everyone. It's a, um, it's a real honor and a thrill to be up here discussing an issue of such urgency and importance. The problem of suffering is uh, not a problem that is um, confined to atheists or agnostics. It's, in fact, a problem even more intensely felt by the believer. Because for the atheist, in some ways, suffering is not a problem. There is no God, so this is just the way the world is. For the believer, however, you always have to ask, why does God permit, tolerate, cause a world that looks like the one we have? Now, in some senses, this is a very difficult question to raise because we are second-guessing God. We're basically saying God is an architect. He made the world this way, and hmm, we think he could have done better. Bart Ehrman says, in a sense, that how do you make, how do we make sense of the world? So the first problem we have, I think, as not just Christians, but as thinking people is, what position are we in to judge the architecture of the universe? In other words, before we undertake a project of reason to explain something, you've got to ask, am I in possession of adequate facts to comment intelligently on the matter at hand. If you show up and somebody says, here's a bunch of clues, don't look at them, but tell me who the murderer is, you'll say, well, I can't. I don't know what these clues actually mean. If you go into a mall or you're out outside in the parking lot and you see a big SUV and the door is open and there's a two-year-old child in a, in a car seat, but it's hot and there's no mom anywhere to be seen, what do you say? Do you say that this mom is a negligent person who should be immediately arrested and locked up because she has no idea how to look after her child? No, because you don't know the mom. She might have excellent reason for running out of that SUV. Maybe her husband is in Starbucks and just had a heart attack. And since you are not in full possession of the relevant facts, you hold back a little bit. You don't know the circumstances over there. And so here we are, human beings. We are part of the universe and we are second-guessing the blueprint of the entire universe. So my first question is, are we really in full possession of adequate facts to be able to say, hmm, we think God could have done better? That's the question that's worth thinking about. Does our human reason have that kind of a compass? Or are we rather more like the ant or the dog, which if given an algebra problem can use all its reason, but still wouldn't in fact solve the problem, not because there isn't a solution, but because the abilities of the ant are not adequate to comprehend it, or not in possession of the adequate data to give an adequate answer. 
Now, when we think about evil, when we think about suffering, in some ways to me this is not a problem about the existence of God. You can say it's a problem about the character of God. In some ways, very often people say there's so much suffering in the world, therefore we are very doubtful that there is a God who, is, who exists who would permit such a thing. But let's imagine, for, for instance, that I have a, a dad who's very powerful, who, is, uh, who has near-infinite resources. Let's say my dad is Bill Gates. And I consider him to be a very loving dad and a very powerful man, and I look to him whenever I'm in difficulty. And then I come across a really serious problem in my life, and I look to my father and say, help me, and he won't help. He isn't there. So what do I conclude? Do I say, well, my dad does not exist? No. I simply say, hmm, maybe my dad isn't quite the guy I thought he was. Maybe I need to reassess my relationship with my dad. Maybe my dad isn't uh, the person I suspected him to be. In other words, I begin to reassess the character of my dad. I don't necessarily question his existence. Well, to me, one fascinating aspect of the book of Job is that there is no flinching from suffering. In Christianity, there is no flinching from suffering. There are other religions, Hinduism and so on, which define suffering as somehow illusory, maya, but not in Christianity. There is looking suffering right in the face. And yet, interestingly, in the book of Job, while a lot of people speculate why is there suffering, it never occurs to anyone in the book to say that there's no God. It never occurs to Job to say God does not exist. That denial of God's existence is in some ways a modern phenomenon excavated out of contemporary suffering. Now, why is there suffering? Usually in thinking about this problem of suffering or problem of evil, we have to make a distinction between what can be called moral evil on the one hand and natural suffering on the other. So moral evil refers to bad things that are done by human beings. Moral agents do moral evil. And then, of course, there's natural suffering. I won't call it natural evil, because there's nothing evil about a tsunami. There's not, a tsunami by itself isn't evil. Now, the wreckage it causes is terrible. But I'll call it natural suffering rather than natural evil, because it's not performed by a human agent. So first, we talk about moral evil. And in some senses, I think the defense raised by Bart Ehrman, which he didn't actually rebut, was that moral evil is comprehensible within the framework of free will. It is a fact that if you are going to have free will, you're going to have to choose between right and wrong, between good and evil. To remove free will is to remove that ability to choose. It isn't necessarily to make us robots, but it is in some sense to make us inhuman. In fact, what do we call people who don't have the ability to choose right from wrong? We call them psychopaths or sociopaths. They're people, in a sense, who are less than human because they don't have that ability to choose. So when people often say, and, and, and Bart had a litany of, of moral horrors from Rwanda to the Holocaust to the killing fields of Cambodia, did, did God do those things? No. Human beings did them. Don't blame God for the Holocaust. That was Hitler and the Nazis. Who did the killing fields of Cambodia? Well, that was the atheist Pol Pot and his Khmer Rouge regime, which in the aftermath of the Vietnam War in three years wiped out some two million people. Rwanda, the Hutus, the Tutsis, tribal hatreds, human beings inflicting terrible things on each other. And that is, in a sense, the great burden of moral choice. If you do something terrible, it's going to hurt innocent people who had no say in the matter. It gives you the awesome uh, burden or responsibility of free choice. I'll come back and talk about the issue of free will in heaven. But in general, the argument that moral evil can be explained as a result of God creating us in His image which is to say, free like him. In some senses, co-creators of circumstances in the universe. And that allows us to do some terrible things to each other. 
But then Bart rightly says that that's not the end of the story because you do have terrible things that happen that human beings had nothing to do with. Uh, tsunamis, uh, hurricanes, natural suffering that seems to come out of, you might say, the laws of nature. And in some ways, Bart says if God is, is omnipotent, he could intervene. In fact, you might raise the question, why have laws of nature in the first place? No laws of nature, no hurricanes, no tsunamis, no earthquakes. Why did God create a lawful universe? Actually, there are some people who think he didn't. Uh, the Muslim scholar Al-Ghazali says there are no laws. God intervenes at every second to make things happen as they do. In some senses, the alternative to a lawful universe is, you might say, a discretionary universe. Everything happens because God wills it. And it doesn't have to happen the same way twice. So if you drop a pen, it goes to the ground, but the next time you drop it, it goes right up. That would be a whimsical universe, unpredictable. Now, try to think about this, because Bart said, free will cannot be used to defend against natural evil. I insist that it can. Because in a whimsical universe, human action would have no predictable consequence. If I were to pull out a gun to shoot you, God could block the bullet. And therefore, my action of trying to kill you, my evil action, is meaningless because you're not going to feel any pain. Because a magical hand is going to come in the way and whisk off the bullet. So in other words, if we don't have a lawful universe, in some senses, human action in the world becomes impossible. Our freedom, we might still be free, but our freedom would carry no consequence because it would be completely unpredictable what was going to happen next. Now, of course, we could still have a lawful universe with miracles. In other words, let's have laws, but God just intervenes like once in a while, maybe every six weeks. Not intervenes with little nuisances. He doesn't block the common cold, but maybe he blocks the horrible hurricanes and tsunamis that kill tens of thousands of people. Now, interestingly, when you look at the Bible, there are a lot of miracles. But to my understanding, these miracles, by and large, are aimed at, you might say, spiritual benefits and not to contravene the laws of nature for their own sake. In other words, God parts the Red Sea for the Israelites to cross. Jesus heals the blind man, but he doesn't heal blindness. The purpose is conversion. It's spiritual. There is a contravention of a law of nature, but it's occasional, it's rare, and it's done for a spiritual purpose. At no point can I find miracles that are done just because God decides that this law, in fact, think about it. If, if God had to do miracles that way, it's kind of a way of saying that my laws are defective. I create a factory to spit out cars, but a bad one comes out every now and then. I've got to do a miracle to correct it. That's a defect. Why do we have earthquakes? The reason we have earthquakes, and by the way, this is not an argument from the Bible. This is an argument from geology. The reason we have earthquakes is underneath the earth are massive tectonic plates that move. And these tectonic plates, it turns out, are absolute prerequisites for life on Earth to exist. In fact, interestingly, scientists have looked for plate tectonics and have not found them on any other known star or planet. They are unique to Earth. And the point I'm getting at here is not merely that you need plate tectonics, because plate tectonics ultimately separate the land from the oceans. If you didn't have plate tectonics, our planet, mostly made up of water, the water would swallow the land, and Earth would be essentially a water world up to a depth of about 400 feet. I get this fact from a book called Rare Earth, written by the geologist Peter Ward and the astronomer Donald Brownlee. The point being that plate tectonics is an absolute prerequisite for life itself to exist on the Earth. And here we can make a broader point, and that is, as scientists study the laws of nature, all the laws, the constants of nature, the speed of light, the electromagnetic force, the strong nuclear force, they have come up with something that is sometimes called the anthropic principle or the principle of fine-tuning. And here's what it means. The laws of the universe are fine-tuned for life. You could have other laws, but if you did, you would not end up with creatures like us. You might not end up with life at all, 
But if you did, you would not get human beings at the end. There's a rather startling theological point hiding here. The anthropic principle, by the way, usually used to try to prove the existence of some kind of a, an intelligent designer. I'm not using it for that purpose. I'm saying something a little different. Modern science shows that this universe cannot function with other laws. That if you had other laws, you wouldn't get Homo sapiens at the end of it. So yes, God could have made other laws, but you'd get a different kind of creature at the end of the process. So if God wanted to use a lawful process and wanted to create creatures like us, modern science tells us that this is the recipe. The laws that exist here and now are the necessary prerequisite for us being here. Now, these laws are in some senses double-edged. The sunshine that makes life possible is also the sunshine that gives us wrinkles and sometimes exposes us to radiation, cancer. Uh, the water that we drink without which we couldn't have life, well, you can drown in it. And so these laws are of such a kind that they can by themselves impose hardship, impose suffering. But here's the other side of it. God has at the same time given us the tools to comprehend these laws and in some ways to overcome them. That is called modern science. And therefore, you can have malaria, but we have a cure for malaria. If you want to know why people are getting malaria right now and suffering and dying from it, that's because this cure that we have already is not being adequately and widely enough distributed. It exists. The fault, in other words, here is not with a God who allows malaria, but with human beings who do not take the actions to, in a sense, achieve the kind of world that God made it possible for us to live in. Thank you very much. We'll now hear a five-minute rebuttal from each debater, beginning with Bart. Also a reminder, after the rebuttals, we'll collect your note cards, so be thinking of questions you might have for our speakers this evening. Well, I'd like to thank Dinesh for that very interesting and powerful uh, uh, statement. Uh, I uh, wish my Rutgers students had been so smart. <laughs> I don't think anybody needs to be second-guessing God when it comes to why they're suffering in the world. Asking why there is suffering is not second-guessing God. Presumably, everybody thinks that God gave human beings extraordinary intelligence. I'm simply asking that we use our intelligence to try to understand our world. It's not challenging God to ask why there is suffering in the world. Dinesh says, what position are we in to ask the question of suffering? Well, we're in the position of being intelligent people who have brains, and we should use them. The book of Job is, a, uh, is probably the best known instance of somebody questioning why there is suffering. In the book of Job, Job wants to know why since he is innocent, he's suffering, and he demands that God appear to him and tell him why he's suffering. God finally does appear to Job, but instead of answering Job's question to tell him why he's suffering, God says, who are you to ask me? I am almighty and you are a peon. God squashes Job under his mighty thumb, and Job writhes on the ground in dust and ashes and repents for even asking. Is that what we should do in the face of the big questions that we have to ask? Should we writhe on the ground and say, well, I'm not going to ask the question because it's too deep for me to understand? Should we admit that we can't know and so we're not going to ask? I don't think so. I don't think the example of Bill Gates deciding to withhold a computer from his son so that his son thinks Bill Gates is somebody different from whom he really thought he was is really an appropriate or an adequate explanation of what we're dealing with with the problem of suffering. God is not Bill Gates, 
And he didn't withhold a computer from a son. There are people starving to death in this world. Yes, if God's in charge of this world, he must be different from what we thought. But where does that leave us? What is he really like? God does intervene in the world according to traditional Jewish and Christian thinking. And my guess is that Dinesh thinks that God intervenes in the world and that he answers prayer. If that's the case, why is it there's so much suffering? Now, Dinesh differentiates between moral evil and uh, natural evil, and he points out that God did not cause the Holocaust. Fair enough. Of course God didn't cause the Holocaust, and nobody said that God caused the Holocaust. But does God answer prayer or not? When six million of his people are crying out to help, does he answer or not? If you think the answer is no, he does not answer prayer, what does that do to your faith? And what does it do to Dinesh's faith? Does God intervene in this world or not? Or maybe he didn't like those Jews. Maybe he would have saved the Christians. Really? Maybe God likes us better than the people who are starving to death because we had a very nice dinner, thank you very much. So maybe God's on our side, but he's not on the side of the people who are suffering. Is that what we want to think? Is that going to be our theology? I simply don't buy the idea that the laws of nature are the way they have to be or we could not have life. I think that this is not a solid argument in the least. Who made the laws of nature? You say, well, if you had some other laws, then it wouldn't work this way. We couldn't have homo sapiens. Right. Within the framework of nature as we have it now, we have to have tectonic plates. You mean God could not create a world without tectonic plates? There have to be tsunamis that kill 300,000 people? Really? There have to be? You're telling me that God couldn't do something different? God couldn't dream up a world without tectonic plates? How limited is God? Is God so limited that he could not create a world without earthquakes and hurricanes and tsunamis and droughts? Is that really the case that God couldn't do it? If that's what you think, then I would say you're probably leaning more toward my direction. I don't believe that, in fact, there could be a God who causes suffering or allow suffering if he could prevent it. And I don't believe if there was an all-powerful God in the world that, in fact, you could say that he can't prevent it. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Bart for a very uh, powerful and passionate statement which I think raises this debate to the next level because in some sense what Bart is saying is why this world? Couldn't there be another world better than this one in which you not only have human beings flawed as we are here but a different set of laws? Now interestingly it is the Christian position that there is such a world. And the meaning of the fall is that there was such a world. I don't want to debate whether whether there was such a world historically or hypothetically, but let's zoom in for a moment into into the Christian understanding of the fall. Here's why, by the way. And I'm not here moving into the domain of revelation. Here we have an atheist challenge that says, in effect, there's a contradiction between Christian theology and the world that we have it. So it's very fair to say, let's look at Christian theology in the full. In other words, it's a fundamental premise of Christian theology that this world is not the only world. So so, suddenly you have to consider if this life is one second in an expanse of eternity, however agonizing that second, what does the plan as a whole say about the ineptitude of God? Let's say that someone suffers horribly for 50 years but is living in eternity in bliss. Has God wronged such a person? Does this prove that God clearly did not exist because in this life, only a part of of the expanse of salvation, God didn't fix his or her problem right then or or there or then? 
So the Christian view, in other words, is much bigger than the hedonistic premise that God's job is to be a cosmic bellboy and make our life as comfortable as possible here and now. You've got to look at Christian theology as a whole. But now I want to look for a moment at the fall because I think it gets to the heart of Bart's question. What was happening in the Garden of Eden? Basically, the Garden of Eden was a place, a sphere, a dimension, if you will, under God's direction. And yeah, there were no laws. Everything worked well. Perhaps E was not equal to MC square in the Garden of Eden. I don't know. But the idea was that God, in a sense, offers human beings a choice. Live under God's direction. You can call that the discretionary universe. Our will is subordinated in all things to God's will. And so are the laws of nature. So is whatever laws operate in Eden. God controls it all. No rotten trees, no trees, no fruit that fall uh, uh, and turn bad. Now, the theme, the, the message of the fall is that human beings rejected that world. Not just Adam and Eve, because I believe we would reject it again if we were given the chance. Our free will inclines us to say, no, we do not want to live under God's world. We want to make our own world. And that means we want to live under our will and do things the way we see fit and manipulate the universe and the earth in the way that we deem best, not God. This is pride. This is the fall. And what does God do? He says, okay. He gives us the world we want. And it's this world. Now, in this world, we are immensely powerful. We can manipulate nature. We can extend life expectancy. We can discover cures for diseases. But in some ways, it's not the perfect world. And Christianity does not claim it is. Christianity, in a sense, claims that this is a world of trial. This is the world we wanted, that God gave us, as a, as a sort of a trial period to decide if we want to live in that other world, always available to us, in which we operate constantly and unremittingly under God's authority and God's will. That, to me, is the meaning of the fall. The two choices put before us as human beings, and it wasn't just Adam and Eve, but I believe all of us in this room, if made to choose again, would choose exactly what Adam and Eve chose, which is to live a life in which our decisions are made unremittingly, constantly by us. And that's the world that Bart has chosen because he says we should use our intelligence and our creativity to investigate nature and to ask why. And we do. And out of that comes science. And out of that comes, in a way, the cure for some of the problems in the world. So God has given us the world. He's also given us the ability to function in the world. Let's come back for a moment to the Holocaust. What is Bart asking God to do? He's basically asking God to cancel out the free will of the Nazis and Hitler. So the Nazis and Hitler say, into the concentration camp you go, but the Jews say, God help us. And God says, sorry Nazis, sorry Hitler, your gas isn't gonna work. In the Jews will go, but they'll come out perfectly happy. Ultimately, we'll ultimately the gas will have no effect. I would submit that, well, we might all say in one case, God could do it. But then what about Cambodia? And what about Darfur? And what about if God intervened in every case to make this happen? What happens to our world in that case? Yes, free will is canceled out. Yes, evil loses all its meaning, but even more significant, so does good. There's no virtue possible in a world in which God is the great corrector. There are, no, there are no sick people to be cared for because their sickness doesn't really matter. There are no hungry people to be fed because they aren't really hungry. They just look it. God's actually already solved the problem inside of them. So I would suggest that in a sense, Bart, for all his passion, hasn't thought it through. He hasn't really specified what is this alternative arrangement that he wants. What does he want God to do? And if God did that, what would the consequences be as they played themselves, themselves out? That is worth thinking about. Thank you. At this time, we'll pause the debate for a second. The ushers will be coming down the aisles, both the sides and the center, to collect the questions you have.
All right, so Dinesh, I want to know whether you believe that God answers prayer, and if you do think so, do you think that God sometimes does intervene in our world? Uh, and the, the, the more involved part of that is, if you think that God does not answer prayer, then I'd like to know, and that he doesn't intervene, I'd like to know in what sense you consider yourself a Christian. If you do think that God answers, answers prayer and does intervene, then I'd like to know whether it bothers you that God doesn't answer prayer for people who are starving to death and being tortured and uh, who are being murdered uh, and so forth. I think that God can and does answer prayer. I think that God can and does intervene in the world. He has, and I believe he still does. Um, and uh, however, I see this intervention in the world as, as rare, as an expression of God's gratuitous love, uh, and something that does not occur on a regular basis. In fact, if it did, there would be no, we, would, we, would, we could no longer speak of the lawfulness of nature. So a miracle, by definition, is a rare contravention of a natural law. But I do believe it does happen and has happened. Okay, for my turn. The problem of evil is often seen as a problem for the believer. I want to suggest it is a problem also for the unbeliever. Because if there is no God, is it not a fact that we are evolved primates, Darwinian creatures, if you will, in the world, uh, struggling to survive and reproduce? without an intelligent designer or a benign creator. Now, if that is the case, here's my question. Isn't it true that the magnitude of human evil defies Darwinian explanation? And what I mean by this is that there is evil in nature, but evil in nature seems very frugally confined to survival. A lion might eat an antelope. But have we ever met a lion that wants to uh, abolish every antelope off the face of the earth? There's no lion Hitler, if you will. A lion will, will, when hungry, kill, but human evil outstrips Darwinian necessity. You have people who want to wipe out entire tribes, and there's torture and cruelty that seems, again, to go far beyond the needs of survival and reproduction. So what is your explanation? If we are Darwinian primates, wherefore comes this kind of evil? What's its source? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm convinced that human evil uh, far surpasses what you find in the animal kingdom. And I don't know what criteria one uses to establish what would be uh, uh, human evil that uh, goes up to a certain level, but beyond that, well, there must be a God. Uh, that doesn't make sense to me. But uh, I'm thinking about my cat right now. Now, my cat loves torture. Uh, when it gets a mouse, it doesn't kill the mouse because it's hungry. It tortures the mouse for, uh, it'll, it'll tort for hours if I let it. Uh, this is something that simply happens in the animal kingdom. Uh, Hitler was an oversized mouse. Uh, I think that uh, the Holocaust is, um, I think, more readily explicable if humans have no constraints on them from above than it is by assuming that there's a God who answers prayer. Uh, and so I don't see it as really a problem for, uh, I mean, you keep referring to atheists, which I, uh, I, I would consider myself to be uh, an agnostic, I consider the uh, enormity of, pro of, of evil in the world to be a much bigger problem for somebody who has faith in a God who created this world and is in some sense sovereign over this world and occasionally intervenes in this world. It's a much bigger problem for somebody of that sort than for somebody who simply says that uh, it is, uh, in fact, there is no divine uh, person over this world in control of it, no loving creator who who is in charge of it, uh, that in fact we're just here by ourselves and that's why there are tsunamis and earthquakes and hurricanes and holocausts. Uh, my turn. Right. Um, 
you suggested that uh, somebody who suffers now uh, may experience a billion years of uh, happiness in the afterlife, and that therefore I'm not looking at the whole of Christian theology, only at a, a very small sliver, uh, and uh, you, you said that I would prefer that we all lead a hedonist life here on earth. Um, I guess I want to know whether you believe in hell, and uh, whether people are, uh, are uh, punished in hell, and whether it's an eternal punishment, and uh, whether God loves the people who are uh, suffering eternal punishment in hell. I'm especially thinking of, for example, uh, somebody in, uh, let's say, in uh, some part of, uh, of Africa, say in southern Africa, who has uh, gotten AIDS, or somebody, uh, some, somebody who is not a Christian, who has gone through horrible suffering here in this world, and then dies, and suffers torment for billions of years. So, I want to know whether you believe that, and if so, how that relates to your understanding of God. Well, I'll say, I'll answer the question. I want to address, before I do, very briefly, the example that you gave about the cat and the mouse, because I think it is a, um, a, a in a sense, based on a fallacy. Um, the mouse who is being tortured by your cat is not being tortured in any sense that we mean the word torture. If someone is torturing me by playfully tossing me up and down with a big bayonet waiting for me to land on it, the reason I'm being tortured is that I can anticipate death. I can see it. I can imagine it. I have the cognitive faculties to apprehend it. And therein lies the torture. The torture is that I'm being playfully dangled before I'm going to be killed in a manner that I can anticipate. There's absolutely no sense that a mouse has the cognitive faculties. In fact, apparent, it seems that no animal does to be able to foresee death to know what death is like, to know that it is going to die. Why does it try to escape? Because it, is, it has a survival instinct built into it, which yes. is Darwinian. So but do that we. doesn't mean it has the cognitive fac faculty to know, I will die, human beings all die, death comes to everyone. The natural instinct that says, run away when you see the lion is not the same as the one that... And so, and in the example that you give, the anticipation is necessary for the torture to make sense. Otherwise, if the cat is dangling the mouse and the mouse feels nothing except I'm being dangled up and down, there is no torture. Does the child who is thrown on the bayonet know that he's going to die? No. But, but in that case, the evil is in the intention of the person doing it. And in this case, the question is whether the cat dangling the mouse is itself engaging in torture in the same way that the Nazis did when they treated the Jews in the way they did. Okay, let's talk about hell. <laughs> Having settled that one. <laughs> the Christian view of God is that God is salvation, right? The Bible says salvation is the gift of God. Now, for many years, I used to think that the Bible was saying that salvation is the gift from God. But no, it doesn't say that. Salvation is the gift of God. God is the gift. God is the gift. Now, we as human beings have the free choice of saying yes to the gift or no. So easy as God made it that all we have to do, no matter what the wreckage of our lives, no matter what the sins we've committed, all we have to do is utter the word, yes. That's it. That's the only prerequisite for salvation. That does it. So if someone says no in the face of a yes and you may enter sign, and if God himself is salvation, to say no to God is to say no to what God is. That is my definition of hell. If God is goodness, purity, beauty, truth, and you say no to God, you are cutting yourself off voluntarily from those divine attributes by your own will. And what does God do? God merely acquiesces in your free choice. So, 
in, this, is the, this is the simple paradigm. There are multiple tough cases. What about the Hindu who's lived a decent life and has never heard of Jesus Christ? I'm not addressing those cases. Um, I noticed. <laughs> but I'm not ducking them either. I, I'm not ducking them. And I'm happy to address the issue because here I think we have a different question, which is the Bible says clearly that Jesus is the only way to salvation, and I believe that. Some people interpret that to mean something else. All those who have not explicitly accepted Jesus go to hell. That is one possible interpretation of the other statement, but not the only one. And in fact, there are many Christians who do not interpret the first statement in the Bible to mean the second statement, which is an interpretation of the Bible. Therefore, if you were to ask me, what happens to the guy in Papua New Guinea who's never heard of God or never heard of Jesus? My answer is, I don't know. I leave that to God's infinite mercy and justice. But no, I'm not declaring that that guy goes to hell because I'm not sure that Bible statement A leads to interpretation B. My turn. Uh, do we have time? Okay. One last question. I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. yeah. One last question. It's all yours. Suffering ultimately is not an intellectual problem. It's, a, it's an emotional problem. If you lose a child, you might wonder why, but really, your main concern is to alleviate the suffering. Uh, how do I feel better? How do I have this wound bandaged and, and, and overcome? So here's my question. Who has a better practical remedy for suffering? The Christian who can say to, this to someone, um, you know, you've lost your son, but you have the hope of an afterlife in which you'll see him again. Offering genuine consolation to a bereaved person in that circumstance, or an atheist who says, stuff happens. You've lost your son. There's no explanation. There's no remedy. Get over it. As a practical matter, who has more resources for coping with suffering? The Christians who started the Red Cross, innumerable organizations to alleviate suffering, or atheism, which basically says, this is the world as it is. Yeah, actually, my view of this, uh, you might be surprised to find, isn't going to be your view. <laughs> um, I think easy answers in the face of real suffering are cruel. I think when you have your son commit suicide or your daughter get killed by a drunk driver, or your wife die because of an aneurysm, that the simple comfort of, don't worry, they're in heaven now, really doesn't go very far. Uh, I think it's a platitude that, in fact, uh, I find offensive, because it doesn't take seriously the real nature of suffering. And I'm, frankly, throughout this entire debate, I've been puzzled a little bit by what seems to me almost an intellectualizing of the problem on your part, that, that you can kind of solve, solve it by, by coming up with clever answers. And this just strikes me like a slogan. I think that the way you comfort somebody is you do what the friends of Job did when he was suffering. They didn't give him platitudes. They came up to him and they sat with him in silence for three days. You show your human support for a fellow human being. You put your arm around the person and you tell them that you feel for them and that you love them and that you're there for them. And in my opinion, that does a world more good than a platitude about the afterlife. Well, Bart, let's look at this for a moment because that's a very revealing statement. None of us knows what comes after death, right? 
You what? haven't been to the other side of the curtain. No, I know, but you just said you did. No. You said no, I didn't say I did. I said you are offering someone Earlier the Earlier you talked about people living forever in the afterlife, I, having suffered here, and I now you've just I said, said that, that this person is, a, is in heaven. I said it's a central proposition of Christian theology, which it is. And you agree with it, don't you? I, and I agree with it on the basis of revelation, but well, I want to... okay. But I, but I, want, but I, want, to, I want to come to your point. As a, as a matter of reason, engaging you as an agnostic, right? Here we have death. It's the final wall or curtain. None of us have been to the other side, Right? There is no other side. Well, there's something that comes after death, whether it's life after or nothing. But, but what my point is we are not in a position to know. Something is not nothing. Either there is life after death or there isn't. Yeah, Can you think no of a third option? There's no other side. That's a nothing. That's not a something. All right. You wrote a book about it. <laughs> The point I'm trying to make is that you are declaring to be a platitude, something that is very much an open question, a real possibility. In other words... It's a, yeah, and you're admitting it's a possibility you don't even agree with. No, I'm... I, 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 in a normal debate, if we were debating the existence of God, the burden of proof would be on me, because I'm saying there's a God, and I would need to prove it. In this debate, the burden of proof is on you because you're saying there is an inherent inconsistency between Christian theology, the Christian God, all-powerful, benevolent, and the framework around that God, and the reality of suffering. So I am perfectly permitted to say, okay, let's see if there is this stated inconsistency. This theology posits the afterlife. I don't have to prove it. I'm simply saying once you look at the full framework, the inconsistency disappears. Yes, you've intellectualized the problem. Uh, that's why we're having a debate. <laughs> but I, I don't mean to imply that suffering doesn't remain a, a deep problem or a deep mystery. The point I wanted to make about life after death is human, there is something in human nature that longs for life to go on. Cultures throughout history and all religions have posited the afterlife as an arena of cosmic justice. Now, they could be making it up, but they could also be right. So why would you dismiss a real possibility which gives real hope and real consolation as a platitude? Because it is a platitude. You're saying uh, it's okay What's that a platitude? Is it a the, statement The platitude that you... is that you have just told somebody whose daughter was killed in a car wreck that it's okay because she'll be in heaven now. I don't think I said it was okay. I said that despite the intensity of this suffering... This does not provide comfort. It has for millions of people through history. It's created enormous guilt as well. It's created terrible suffering from people who think that they shouldn't mourn somebody because, after all, it was God's will. It's created pain for people who feel that their mourning is inadequate because they should be actually mourning more. Most people feel like, you know, if, if my child is in heaven, then it should be okay. Well, it's not okay. If I may. Our first question, which each of you... <laughs> which each of you will get two minutes to respond to each. We'll go in the same order. The first question has to deal with this, with an extension of this, uh, this discussion. So we'll deal with it in two-minute responses very similar to what we've just been discussing. What do you do to help alleviate the suffering in our world? Bart, Bart you first, and then Dinesh. Uh, this is asking what we personally do? Yes. Yes, okay, good, great. Uh, yeah, I, um, it's an interesting question because uh, when I became an agnostic, uh, I thought, I, I was afraid to become an agnostic in part because I thought that that would uh, really change my moral compass and that I would become what, uh, what Dinesh is describing as a hedonist uh, and that it would all, since this life is all there is, all I would be interested in doing would be uh, seeking out my own pleasure because if there's no afterlife, why not? Let's party. Uh, uh, it turns out it's not that way at all. I have found that, in fact, uh, being an agnostic has made me more concerned for the welfare of uh, my fellow, um, fellow men and women. Uh, that, in fact, I am more concerned about issues of uh, justice in the world and oppression. 
uh, and poverty and homelessness and hunger. Uh, what do I, I mean, what do I personally do? I give away tons of money. Uh, I, uh, I uh, try to help uh, people who are homeless and who are hungry, far more than I did when I was a, uh, committed, uh, a committed Christian. That doesn't mean that every agnostic does, but I think that it's false to say that since Christians started the Red Cross, they're better than the atheists. Uh, well, uh, one could point to all sorts of, uh, of charities that are run by people who are not people of faith. Uh, Doctors Without Borders would be an excellent, uh, an excellent example. People who are agnostic or atheist are just as ethical as, uh, as Christians, and uh, they are just as concerned about issues of justice and poverty and oppression and hunger as Christians. And uh, I think that, in fact, uh, all of us, whether we happen to be Christian or not, should, uh, should in fact, ratchet it up a notch. Uh, because I think, in fact, all of us can do more, and we don't need religious reasons to do it. I do think we can do more. We should do more. And there are atheists, um, and some, sometimes um, atheists um, are, are um, exemplary in their um, altruism, philanthropy, and so on. As a matter of data or not to go by personal anecdote, but to look at facts, it is the case that there are important differences. There was a study recently published by the sociologist Arthur Brooks called Who Cares? And it looks in America at who are the people who do the most in terms of charity, not just in terms of giving money, but volunteering time. And it divides America into four groups. The secular, the religious conservatives, the religious liberals, the secular conservatives, and the secular liberals. And it concludes at the end of, a, of the study that the group that does the most in America today are the religious conservatives. The group that does the second most are the religious liberals. The group that does the third most are the secular conservatives. And the group that does the least, which happens to be the group that has the most resources, are the secular liberals. So that, for example, a secular liberal in San Francisco making three times the income of a religious conservative in Tupelo, Mississippi, will give approximately the same amount in real dollars in charity. So obviously the guy, the religious conservative, having much less is giving proportionately far more. Again, I don't want to make too much of this, but I do think it is a fact uh, that um, the data seem to show that a belief in, the, in God uh, and in Christianity does seem to motivate acts of altruism and sacrifice, and we do see those quite obviously in the world. Our next question is for Bart. Why do you call yourself agnostic, not atheist? Why am I not, we say it again? Why do you call yourself agnostic and not ah. atheist? Yes, okay, so why agnostic and not atheist? Um, so, uh, I, you know, I didn't know until I became an agnostic just how militant uh, both atheists and agnostics really were. <laughs> I, I always thought they were just kind of the same thing, uh, but they're not. Uh, it turns out that atheists get really angry with agnostics who refuse to be atheists. Uh, the, way, the way I, uh, I usually put it is that uh, an, uh, all atheists think that agnostics are simply wimpy atheists. Uh, <laughs> You know, they can't really fess up. And, and all agnostics think that atheists are just arrogant agnostics. <laughs> uh, the reason to be an agnostic... So an agnostic, an atheist... The, my definite... This is another problem. Everybody defines these terms differently, even atheists and agnostics. So let me tell you my, term, my definitions. My definition of an atheist is somebody who declares that there is no God, who just says they don't believe that there, there is a God, there is no God. An agnostic says, I don't know. Now, I don't believe in the God of the Bible. Uh, and so if, if that's the definition of an atheist, then I'm an atheist. I don't believe that the God, I don't believe in the God who created the world, who called Israel to be his people, who gave Israel his law, who sent Jesus into the world to die for the sins of the world, who raised Jesus from the dead. I don't believe that God exists. Is there other, some other greater force in the universe? I don't know, and neither does anyone else. 
uh, I think that at uh, the end of the day, we're all agnostics, even the atheists. Uh, I think that the universe is such an amazing, awe-inspiring place that at the very least, it demands some humility. And I think that the declaration that there can't be a God is, uh, anything, but a declar is anything but humility. And so, uh, so that's why I continue to be an agnostic rather than an atheist. Thank you. First of all, the believer is much closer to the good agnostic as you describe him than you realize. Think about the connotations of the term believer. A believer is distinguished from a knower. If you know something, you wouldn't say you believe in it. You believe in something when you don't know for sure. I, would, I believe in the planet Uranus. I haven't been there, but I believe it's out there. I wouldn't say I believe in my brother, because I know the guy. <laughs> so knowledge is of a different status than belief. The reason we call ourselves believers is we don't know. In fact, that's why there's faith. Faith is the bridge between belief and knowledge. Now, I don't want to comment too much about, on, on Bart, because I don't... What I want to say is this, and this strikes me as sort of interesting about people who are on the rampage against belief. Bart's written a lot of books misquoting Jesus, he can't trust the Bible, he's doing Whoa, more. whoa, 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 whoa. I am not on a rampage against belief. Well... That is absolutely false. All right. Uh, you're a debunker of belief? No. You are a questioner of belief? I'm a debunker of fundamentalism. Okay. Well, and you should be. But... Um, <laughs> because... Well... That's a different issue. Well, <laughs> Bart's debunking his old self, and maybe there's good reason to. All right. Um, point I want to make is this about agnostics, and that is agnosticism really implies a sort of openness, perhaps even indifference, because if you really don't know, then what do you do? Generally, you ignore it. I don't know if there's life on other planets, but I don't go debating guys who think there is. I don't know if there are unicorns. I don't believe there are. But I haven't written any books called The Unicorn Delusion, <laughs> The End of Unicorns. Unicorns are not great. So, and, and, and Bart's not in the company of the new atheists, I have to say. But nevertheless, I do want to make the point that there is something about this new atheism, uh, the aggression about it, and its obsession with God. One of the my atheist debating partners, Christopher Hitchens, I think he probably thinks a lot more about God than a lot of lukewarm Christians. So there's an interesting thread that links belief and aggressive unbelief. The next, next question is for you. If we would all reject God's will and the fall, and if God is all-knowing, wasn't God's test a big joke? Because he created us knowing we'd fail. A test is not, well, first of all, it's important to realize that when we think about God's foreknowledge, God knowing in advance, let's say that Adam and Eve would sin, uh, God doesn't, does not have foreknowledge in the sense that we normally think. Uh, if somebody predicts that the stock market will go up or go down and claims to know, they have foreknowledge. But that's because they're living in time. In the Christian view, God is outside of time. He's, time operates as a line. God's on, on this side of the line. He can see the past, the present, and the future. So God doesn't have foreknowledge. He just has knowledge. So your question has to be recast. Does knowing what someone will do in a given situation invalidate the free choice or the value of the person making their own decision? I might know, for example, that my 15-year-old daughter, I don't know for sure, but let's say I did, would become a doctor. And yet I tell her, Danielle, you go to school, look at what subjects interest you, and choose freely where you want to go. I happen to know what she's like. I happen to know her interests. Let's say I know for sure that she'll go to medical school. 
Nevertheless, my knowledge imposes no restrictions on her choice. She is completely free to go in any direction she wants. So God's knowing what man will do with free will in no way cancels out the value of that free will. I have no opinion on the subject. <laughs> Bart, the next question is for you, actually. In your critique of the Bible, you did not address the most powerful answer to suffering, namely a God who lives and dies in this suffering world to rescue us. How do you respond to the answer of the cross? Yes, I, um, I think that is a powerful answer to, uh, to suffering. I don't think it's a biblical answer. Uh, the cross is obviously biblical. Uh, in my book, I talk about uh, the cross as a... Uh, in, in the context of understanding that um, suffering can be redemptive uh, and uh, often in the Bible is redemptive, that there can be redemptive suffering. So there, there are a couple of kinds of redemptive suffering that I think all of us experience. I mean, sometimes something really bad happens to us that turns out for the good. Uh, and so often there's, there's a silver lining. Uh, and so the... Uh, well, we all, we all have instances in which something bad happened to us that we're, you know, 20 years later, we're really glad it happened to us because it changed our lives. Uh, in my case, uh, when I got hepatitis when I was 16, I was not particularly happy about the situation. Uh, and uh, I, was, I was laid up and was unable to do anything in the middle of the summer. And, uh, but it, it, what it ended up doing is making me starting to read books and to start uh, focusing on the debate topic that was going to be that year's debate topic in high school. And uh, it turned me from being a, a very mediocre second baseman uh, that summer to uh, being somebody very interested in academics. And if it, that had not happened, I never would have become a scholar. So uh, there's a redemptive side to that suffering of hepatitis. Very minor instant, but uh, there it is. There's other suffering, uh, though, which is more than uh, just a silver lining. Uh, some redemptive suffering uh, means that suffering actually produces an ultimate good. Uh, and this would be the teaching, the Christian teaching of the cross, that the suffering of Jesus on the cross brought about salvation, uh, and that salvation therefore requires suffering. I think um, a lot of uh, agnostics have trouble with this understanding that God required his son to die on a cross in order to bring salvation. Because uh, for, many, uh, for many unbelievers, it, it seems like God really uh, didn't need a human sacrifice. If God wanted to forgive people, why didn't he just forgive people? Or in Dinesh's terms, if God just demanded a yes, why did he demand a blood sacrifice? Uh, a yes would have been sufficient, thank you very much. Uh, so it, is a, it certainly is a teaching in the Bible that, that suffering brings uh, redemption, but I think it's a, it's a point of view that outside of the Bible, nobody, we don't have anymore. Uh, so it's interesting that people subscribe to this idea when it's in the Bible, but they don't think about it in, in their lives. We don't think that we have to sacrifice our children so that we'll have a happy life. Uh, so, uh, so that's an interesting phenomenon. The, the, the particular question, though, is, is God suffering with us? And I would suggest that that point of view is a modern theological point of view, which is a very powerful point of view, but it's not a point of view that the Bible advances. In the Bible, God does not suffer with us. I agree that that is a modern reading. However, I want to say this about the issue of... Um, Christ's sacrifice and atonement. The important thing to realize about sin is that at a human level, it cannot be atoned for. Think about something that you've done that's really wrong. Let's say I commit adultery against my wife, or you do emotional harm to someone. How do you atone for that? You can say, well, you say you're sorry, but that doesn't remove the crime or the offense. You can say, I'll be nice to them from now on, but that's no atonement. You should be nice to them in the first place. How do you cancel out the bad thing that you've already done? You can't. You've done it. So how are sins to be atoned for by anyone? They can't be. What's done is done. 
So, if God is a God of justice, there needs to be atonement. And if we can't do it, there needs to be either damnation or somebody has to do it for us. That's the meaning of Christ's sacrifice. It's not a matter of suffering with us, which is a modern, and I agree, a little bit of a touchy-feely view of the matter, but removing the touchy-feeliness of it, there still has to be atonement. And without the atonement, the yes doesn't work. So it isn't just God saying, say yes. It is say yes to Christ's sacrifice, and then the pathway is clear. So there's nothing for us to do except to say yes, but that's because the atonement has been done by someone else, and that is, in a sense, by God himself. Our last question from the audience, this is to both of you. Bart, we'll start with your answer and then follow with Dinesh's. Without God's character as a basis for good, how do you measure evil? With, I'm sorry, without what? I'll read the question again. Without God's character as a basis for good, how do you measure evil? Uh, without God's character for good, how do you measure evil? I think that uh, it's, it's, it's a problematic statement to think that we know what is good because of God. Um, because how, I mean, where does one even start with that? Uh, let, me, uh, let me start with the Bible. This is from the uh, book of uh, Amos in the Old Testament where uh, we hear about the character of God. Amos chapter 3. Uh, I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town, yet you didn't return to me, says the Lord. In other words, God made them hungry. He starved them. I withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away. I sent no rain on your town, yet you did not return to me. I sent plagues among you, as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword. This is God speaking. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps, yet you have not returned to me. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, yet you have not returned to me. God starves people, he creates drought, he creates military disaster, and he murders them so that they will turn back to him. How do we measure the goodness of God? Is, are these good acts? Is our morality to be based on the actions of God? Should we starve our children to get them to behave? not give them anything to drink, murder them so that they will do what they're supposed to do. Um, I think it's difficult to say that our morality is based on the morality of God because the morality of God as portrayed in the Bible at least would be considered by almost anyone as a rather dubious morality. You say, yes, but he was God. Absolutely, that's right. That means, though, that God's standards are not your standards. So where do you get your moral standards from? Well, if it's from God, then you must be starving your children, according to Amos, anyway. I would suggest we know what's good and evil because we know what's good for one another. I think Jesus is the one who had it right. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus wasn't the first one to come up with this idea. Or the idea that you should do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is not distinctive to Jesus. This is a teaching found throughout the religions of the ancient world. You should do to one another as you... As you, you should do to someone else what you want them to do to you. I think this can be a basis of morality. You treat people the way you want to be treated. You don't need God for that. I don't believe in God, and yet I try to follow this principle. It's a principle that... People have dignity as human beings and should be treated as human beings. They should be treated the way we want to be treated. You do that and you lead a good life, and I don't believe you need God for it. It's true that there is nothing uniquely Christian about the golden rule, but there is something very uniquely Christian about the idea of forgiveness, which does not appear in any other religion. There is a saying in Christianity that 
the New Testament is in the Old concealed, and the Old Testament is in the New revealed. This is another way of saying that as Christians, we don't read the Old Testament as the Jews did. In other words, it's not the end of the matter, and you can't take a passage out of it, whether of Abraham's sacrifice or any other, and read it in complete isolation. The early Christians insisted that every passage in the Old Testament must be read in the light of the new uh, uh, era launched by Christ and then the documents that came out of that. So, for example, Abraham's sacrifice of his son, uh, in which the son says to his father, where is the lamb? And Abraham says, God will provide a preview of Christ, who was the Lamb of God, to come in the New Testament. So again, if you cut off the New Testament and read passages from the Old, it becomes difficult to explain or defend, but read as a whole, the Bible conveys a very different message. Now, I want to make a, a final and important distinction here that gets lost. Nobody is claiming, I'm not, that morality, that morality requires the Bible or God for us to recognize it. It's not as if when I read the Ten Commandments, I said, hmm, thou shalt not kill. Wow, I had no idea. I thought killing was great. But now that I read it in the Bible, I got to stop doing it. I already knew it was wrong. I already knew stealing was wrong. I already knew I shouldn't covet my neighbor's wife or his goods. I knew all that stuff before I ever read the Ten Commandments. How did I know it? Because morality is built into human nature. It is what Adam Smith called the impartial spectator, the voice within. Of course, the atheist has that voice. The atheist is human. He has a human nature. He has morality. There's a separate question. What is the source of the impartial spectator and human beings, believer and unbeliever alike? Where does that voice come from that not only has no Darwinian explanation, but often blocks Darwinian imperatives? I want to have sex with every beautiful woman, but this little voice in my head goes, don't do it. Stop. This voice, which seems to come almost from outside of me and yet speaks with unimpeachable authority, I don't have to obey it, but I can't avoid that authority, that voice may need to have some external and divine source. So two separate issues. Morality is in all human beings, but can it be explained without ultimately pointing to a divine source? I'm not sure. Thank you. We'll now begin our closing statements, as has been our order all night. Bart will lead, and Dinesh will conclude our evening. So Bart. Well, let me thank you all again for being uh, both attentive and uh, kind uh, to, uh, to me during this, uh, during this debate, and thanks to Dinesh for uh, a lively uh, exchange. I'd like to conclude by talking about how I personally deal with the problem of suffering. My view, as it turns out, is a biblical view. It's the view of the book of Ecclesiastes. According to the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a lot that we can't know about this world. A lot of the world doesn't make sense. Sometimes there's no justice. Things don't go as planned or as they should. A lot of bad things happen, but there are also a lot of good things that happen. The solution to life is to enjoy it while we can because it is fleeting. This is the main teaching of the book of Ecclesiastes. This world and everything in it is temporary, transient, and soon to be over. We won't live forever. In fact, we won't live long. And so we should enjoy life to the fullest as much as we can, as long as we can. That's what the author of Ecclesiastes thinks, and I agree. The idea that this life is all there is should not be an occasion for despair and despondency, but just the contrary. It should be a source of joy and dreams. Joy of living for the moment and dreams of trying to make the world a better place, both for ourselves and for others in it. This means working to alleviate suffering and bringing hope to a world without hope. The reality is that we can do more in dealing with the problems people experience in our world. 
To live life to the fullest means, among other things, doing more. There does not have to be world poverty. The wealth could be redistributed, and still there would be plenty for plenty of us to be stinking rich. There don't have to be people sleeping on the streets in my city of Durham, North Carolina. Children don't really need to die of malaria. Families don't need to be destroyed by waterborne diseases. Villages don't need to die of massive starvation. Old people do not need to go for weeks on end without a single visitor. Children don't have to face the prospect of going to school without a healthy breakfast. By all means, and most emphatically, I think that we should work hard to make the world, the one we live in, the most pleasing place it can be for ourselves. We should love and be loved. We should cultivate our friendships, enjoy our intimate relations, cherish our family lives. We should enjoy good food and drink. We should eat out and order unhealthy desserts. We should cook steaks on the grill and drink Bordeaux. We should walk around the block, work in the yard, and watch basketball. We should travel and read books and go to museums and look at art and listen to music. We should make love, have babies, and raise families. We should do what we can to love life. It's a gift, and it won't be with us for long. But we should also work hard to make our world the most pleasing place it can be for others. Whether this means visiting a friend in the hospital, giving more to a local charity or an international relief effort, volunteering at the local soup kitchen, or expressing our opposition to the violent oppression of innocent people. What we have in the here and now is all that there is. We need to live life to its fullest and help others as well to enjoy the fruits of the land. In the end, we may not have the ultimate solutions to life's problems, but just because we don't have an answer to suffering does not mean that we cannot have a response to it. Our response should be to work to alleviate suffering wherever possible and to live life as well as we can. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for coming to this debate. I want to thank Bart for what has been really an interesting and spirited exchange. I think at the end of the day, of course we should enjoy life. Of course life is a gift. And in some senses, I think it's a gift we don't fully appreciate because if we think about our lives, and this would apply not just to you and me, but a all the guys I grew up with in India on the streets of Mumbai. When we look at our lives, we can always identify some bad things that happened to us. Bart's hepatitis, me standing at my father's grave. We remember these incidents and they bother us and we ask why. And yet at the same time, if we were to think not about our life, but about the last week or the last month or the last year, and someone said, could you list the good things that have happened in your life? this list would be inexhaustibly long. It would be, it would overwhelm, if you will, for most of us, the hepatitis and the anguish of standing at my dad's grave. Now, life is short, and in its brevity, there is great value. God doesn't wrong us, by the way, with death. And God has given to different creatures different lifespans. To the elephant, 150 years. To the dog, 20. To the fly, a few days. Is God being unjust to the fly? No, because the fly is still ahead of the game. When we look at our life, even people who have suffered a lot rarely commit suicide. Even amputees and people in wheelchairs hang on to life. Even people at the very old cling to life. Why? Because by their own computation and by their own balance sheet, the plus side is greater than the minus side. Even by their calculus, it's better. Bart ultimately has the burden of proof in this argument because he's saying that the existence of suffering and its magnitude in some senses makes incoherent or makes implausible the existence of God. 
his method of proof has been to look at the answers to suffering given in the Bible, the arguments that he claims doesn't work. I want to suggest that this argument is a little bit of a non-starter for me because the Bible does not contain any arguments at all on any subject. The Bible doesn't try to prove why there's suffering or why there isn't. The Bible doesn't try to prove there's a God. The Bible simply declares it. The Bible doesn't try to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. It merely asserts it. The Bible is not a book of proof. It is a book of revelation. It says, this is the way things are. So for Bart to look to the Bible and say, I don't find the answer, I'm looking for why, and the Bible doesn't say why, is in some senses, I think, to be looking in the wrong place or to be reading the Bible in the wrong way. Philosophically, suffering is a problem. As preachers who ask why, we're going to be asking why. And we don't always know the answer, but the reason that Job submits to God is not that God overpowers him. Ultimately, Job just wants to know that there's a smarter guy than him who's in charge. And when God shows up and says to Job, did you make the universe? Are you responsible for the ark of the sky? Are you responsible for the rising and the falling of the seas? Job's humility is to recognize, in a sense, that no, we humans, in a sense, not that we don't have reason, but is our reason of a sufficient compass to proclaim judgment on the creator of the universe? Sort of like saying, is Hamlet in a position to dispute William Shakespeare? No. Shakespeare stands outside the play and is, in some sense, the cause of the action within it. We are creatures within the play trying to understand the action as Hamlet does. But in some sense, we have to ask, what can we say about the God who is the author of the play? And I think the proper response in that sense is Job's response. Submission, worship, and humility. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bart. Enjoyed it. Thank you.